Okay, so if you are ready, we can start on C, okay? Okay. So welcome everybody to this last lecture on flavor. This is a tutoring class. Here we have also some Sumensari with us today. So thanks a lot also to make the, this lecture. Uh, just a few things before starting. Remember that at the end of this lecture, um, there will be the CMS virtual visit. I will go, I'm going to put the link to the visit on the chat at the end of the lecture. And remember that uh, next week we will start at 10 a.m. on Monday. So it will be all the weeks in Neutrinos next week. Now, please, uh, I'll see you go on. Please share your screen. Okay, thanks a lot, Luca. And so let me share my screen. So now I should be able to see the exercises. Okay, hello, everyone. My name is Osir, and it's a pleasure to guide you through this tutorial on flavor physics. So um, if you go to the school webpage, you'll be able to find this uh, PDF file with the exercise we will plan to solve today. And here you, you have my email if you, if you have further questions after the tutorial. So feel, feel free to ask me. And please don't be shy today. So if you have questions, ask uh, Luca that will relay the messages to me. Okay, and today we have a couple of exercises that will be useful to illustrate uh, the content of the lectures. The first one is about flavor change in neutral currents and what happens when you have a Higgs sector that's a bit bigger than, less minimal than what we have in the standard model. The second exercise is about the CKM matrix. So here we'll be do some trigonometry to understand um, a bit better the unitary triangle. And the third exercise is about uh, accidental symmetries of the standard model, and in particular, a bio number violation. And lastly, uh, we have an exercise, a short one on, on the B physics anomalies um, that uh, Yerne mentioned um, during the last lecture. Okay, so as you see, it, it's a bit uh, an ambitious program. So I'll, sometimes I'll have to skip um, um, steps in, in the derivations, but uh, I'll provide you with the solutions next week. And as I said, uh, don't hesitate to, to write me if you want to further details. Okay, so, so that we can now start. And we start with the first exercise. So let me switch here. Okay, so uh, the first exercise is about flavor change in neutral currents in a model with two Higgs tablets. So one more than in this other model. And, and here, uh, let me read the problem. So in, in the first part, uh, we we'll, that this will be just a reminder of how, why in the standard model, flavor change in neutral currents are forbidden at your level. So, so they can only appear through loops. Then after that, uh, we, we will we'll see what happens uh, in the electric sector when you have two Higgs tablets. And we will show that uh, nothing changes in terms of the masses of the gauge bosons. Then in the third part, uh, we will look uh, again to the, the Yukawa interactions, but now with two Higgs tablets, and we will see that uh, the same property of F, C, and C at three level is still respected uh, for the neutral gauge currents, namely the, the, the Z boson and the, the photon. But then we'll show that uh, when you have scalar bosons, um, you can actually have three level F, C, and C in, in, in this setup, which is of course a, a phenomenological problem because these are very tight constraints on, on the center model and on the physics. Okay, so, so let's start. And this is just a recap about the center model. Here, um, you, you have seen this in lectures. The only difference is that uh, we use this vector notation. So Psi is any of the fermions that we have in the center model that can be uh, the electric singlets of up down type quarks, the, the electrons or the doublets. And here I put it three flavors in the same vector. So for example, when I write L, I mean that, um, so let, let's say E, E right? Uh, what I mean is that I, I have the electron and I have the muon and I have the tau, okay? So in this way, uh, the UCO interactions, they can be written as a matrix equation. But here you have three by three complex matrices, which are the Yukawa couplings. And then that will couple the quark doublets to the down singlets, same for the up type quarks with the, the conjugate Higgs doublet and for the leptons. Okay, so let's look again the question. So the, here we want to, to show, to, to, to go from here where we are 
first to, to break the electric symmetry to find the interactions in the in the interaction basis and then see what happens when you go to the mass basis and um, as you all know now uh, when electric symmetry breaking um, breaking happens the higgs tablet it picks a vep so here i'm working the unitary gauge so so i have the, the double to be just the Higgs plus V here in the second component, where V is the electric VEV 246 GV that's determined by the mu lifetime. And if you look at, again at this equation, and if you just replace the the the, the Higgs by its VEV and and the, the, the physical Higgs, so the Higgs boson here, this is what happens. So so each of these terms will give rise to these uh, mass matrices that are related to the Yukawa couplings uh, in this way. So the mass matrix of each of the fermion types, up quarks, down quark, down type quarks, and leptons, is just proportional to the Yukawa matrices matrix times the five. Okay, but here M is a general three by three matrix, so you, you have to diagonalize it. And the way we do that is by means of a bi unitary transformation. So each of the fermions in the interaction basis can be rotated with a unitary transformation here for each of these guys. And then with, with, when you do that, you can show that um, there is a choice of unitary matrix matrices such that um, U left uh, dagger M U can give you a diagonal matrix that has the masses of each of these fermions. So basically when you do this rotation and you replace this equation, we find this Lagrangian, where the only difference is that I have a, a diagonal matrix here. So that's my notation. Whenever there is a hat, it means a diagonal matrix, which contains the masses. Okay, uh, already at this level, you see that the Higgs Yukawas, um, so uh, these are the masses, but here I also have the interactions with the Higgs. And the Higgs in the standard model also have flavor conserving couplings to fermions. Okay, so that, that's an important point. Keep that in mind. And now the question is what happens uh, for the gauge interactions? Um, so when you do these rotations and the couplings of the W and the Z to the fermions, if you look first at the neutral current interactions, and uh, we use this matrix notation here to, 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 to write the couplings. So a, yeah. to, to, to write the couplings of the Z and the photon that's contained here in the covariance derivative to fermions. So the, the point is that uh, first you have couplings of the same types of fermions on the left and right here. And the covariance derivative is exactly the same for, for the three generations. So in this matrix notation, I have just an identity here, three by three. So when you perform the rotation that we just mentioned here, we will just find that u dagger times identity times u, which is the identity. So, so the interactions for the neutral currents, they remain diagonal when you go from flavor to mass basis. So that's why the Z coupling to fermions, it's only possible when you have the same flavor. So that's proportional to delta IJ. Okay, that's for the neutral current interactions. But for the charged current, the story is of course uh, different because this is the interaction of the, the W to the fermions in the flavor basis. And here we have an up-type quark and a down-type quark. And then when we rotate, of course, uh, there are different matrices for, for these two types of fields. So we end up with uh, this product of uh, U, U, L, dagger, U, D, L. And this is what we call the CK matrix. So this is the only source of flavor violation that we have in this standard model. And um, it comes from this misal um, misalignment within the, the quark tablet. So you do not... Um, the, the rotation that you use to diagonalize the up type interactions and the down types, they are, they are not the same. So there is a, a misalignment here that uh, has phenomenological implications. 
And, and these are the fact that the W interactions now, if you look at an up quark and a down type quark, they're not necessarily diagonal, but they are parameterized by the CK matrix. Okay, and then this is how the Lagrangian um, looks like, the full Lagrangian. So we have the neutral currents. Now we have the charged currents that have the CKM. And we have the Higgs interactions, which are diagonal. Okay, so now let's see what happens when we have two Higgs tablets. So first of all, let, let's count the number of degrees of freedom that we have. So what is the number of Higgs uh, physical scalars? We have two complex doublets. So that means that we have two times two degrees of freedom. But we know that three of these are going to be eaten by the gauge bosons to, to get a mass. Two times four, sorry. Because it, yeah, it's a two by two complex doublet. So it's eight minus three, and that gives five. So, and these are um, small h, that is a standard model like Higgs. But then we have other additional fields. We can also have a, a CP even Higgs, that's a capital H, a CP odd Higgs that we call A0. And we have a charged Higgs that comes from here from the upper component. So this is what we identify with the standard model Higgs. And these are additional scalars that we have now in the spectrum. And then the question, uh, the question asks uh, to show that the mass of the gauge bosons are the same as in the standard model. Okay, so let's show that. Yes, and the masses of the gauge bosons, they, they, they come from, from, from the Higgs Lagrangian. So, Let's uh, write just the part that has the gauge bosons, so namely the covariant derivative a theta mu phi a square. Okay. Well, we're here the scalar potential and so on. I'm not writing because it did not matter for what what we're going to do. Okay. Now, now when the Higgs gets a VEP, and now we have two VEPs that we call here v1 and v2. This is what happens. So, of course, from, from the covariant derivative, you, you have a first term that's just the ordinary derivative. And then for the, let's say, for the first doublet, if you expand this, you get v1 times square root of two. And then uh, let me remind you that the covariant derivative is, is what is. For the Higgs doublet, it's given by this. So when you replace here, um, so basically the terms that can give a mass to the Higgs bosons are the ones that have no derivative. So when I square all of this, I just need to keep the square of the last two terms here. So that means that we have a, a matrix equation, tau mu plus g prime over two b mu i times the same thing. Using that uh, the, the, the poly matrices are emission. B mu y. And now here I have zero and v1 square root of two. That of course the couples to all the Higgs, but we do not care about that because we only want to, to find the masses of the gauge bosons. Okay, so th that's v1. And then uh, actually for v2, you have the same thing. So that's why we put a summation index here. And now what happens is that uh, is that this part here is exactly the same thing that we have in the standard model. And, and it's the same for the two, two webs that we have. So you, you, you can just, um, so it, it, this, the same equation, it can be written in, in the following way. So it's just zero V square root of two times this. And see, you know, V square root of two. 
where v is going to be nothing else than v squared is going to be v1 squared times v2 squared. And this is exactly what we have in the standard model. So, so that's why, despite the fact that we have tweaks doublets, we, we find exactly the same mass matrix here. So when, when, when you expand it, maybe to, to have, and this will give you the W mass, the Z mass, and uh, you can find the physical fields. And what we, we find in the end is that the whole, that's called the whole parameter remains one if you have two Higgs doublets. And now it's clear from this derivation that it's true for two, but also if I had a 17 Higgs doublet, so the whole parameter would, would still be one. And we would just have this, um, the, the, this, uh, this relation between the different fabs to give what we find in the mu Okay. Very good. Now we can move on to the third question. And now the, the point is, let's look at the, the, the F, C, and Cs. So first of all, let's write the, the Yukawa matrix in the presence of two Higgs tablets. And what changes now is that uh, instead of having one Yukawa matrix for, for each type of fermion, now we have two. So we have A that goes from one to And the same thing for uh, type quarks. For, with the conjugate tablets and for the laptops. A. I have to add the initial conjugate. And here, Y, Psi, A. These are again three by three matrices. Okay, now let's, so for simplicity, let's keep just the terms with the down type quarks. That would be enough to illustrate uh, the point concerning the FCMCs. So let's keep just one of these terms. Okay, now let's break the electric symmetry. Remembering that now we have two verbs. And then if we do so, this is what we find now. So we have the down quark, left-handed. Now you have the u matrix of one with V1 of square root of two. By D2, V2 square root of two, D right. And then you have additional couplings here uh, with the Higgs bosons. So maybe, maybe we can write that explicitly because we're going to use it. So we use this parameterization. So we have O1 plus I1 eta1 is square root of two. D right minus O2 square root of two. Was the Hermitian conjugate. So from here, you can read off, um, read off the quark masses. What are they? They're just going to be this combination of the Yukawa matrices, the one square root of two. It was square root of two. And um, so again, we, we can find the Unitary matrices, the left, the right, such that U D L dag M D U D right is a uh, is diagonal. So, I've written diagonal M D. MS. Okay, so far so good. Now let, let's look at the couplings of the Z boson. So for, for the Z boson, 
as before. We had Psi bar, Psi. And here, when you perform these unitary rotations, nothing changes with respect to the previous example, because again, we have the same thermal here and there, and we have the identity because um, the gauge interactions of this under model, the, the neutral part does not see flavor. So this gives the neutral current. So still in this scenario with two Higgs doublets, the Z couplings to two fermions, they, they, they will be diagonal. And now the question is what happens to the scalars? And from here, perhaps you can see already the problem. And the problem is the fact that if you look at the couplings of the, the, the scalar fields now to, to the down type quarks, they are not the same as the mass matrix as we had in the standard model. So when you look at MD, YD1, and YD2, these matrices are not, in general, simultaneously diagonalizable. So when you perform this rotation, that you need to diagonalize the mass matrices, that doesn't mean that the couplings of the, the, the neutral scalars here will be diagonal. So here there was one. There was a typo, of course. And, and the meaning of that is, of course, that now if you have a process like S and D, you could have, could have the exchange of a neutral scalar that goes to D and S, OK? So this is turning a K0 bar into, into a K on. And if you have a three-level contribution, you know that the mass of these particles has to be quite large. Otherwise, you have a, a phenomenological problem because these are very suppressed and very well-measured uh, uh, quantities experimentally. Okay, so this is the main problem of these Higgs um, scenarios. So in reality, to complete this proof, uh, you would have to rotate uh, these fields here, Ho and Eta and the, the, the Phi, to, to go to the mass basis after writing the, the full scalar potential. OK. Uh, is that a question? Uh. Yes, I didn't want to interrupt you. I was waiting for the right moment. <laughs> okay. In any case, there is a question. Um, what if the two matrices commute? as they are simultaneously diagonalizable, can we look at this case? Yeah, so if they commute, then it's true, you don't have the SNCs. So, so from this exercise, what we, what we learn is that uh, you should be careful with the most general case where you, that you would just write all the couplings because it, it can be a problem phenomenologically. But then if you have a good ansatz or a, a good symmetry that, um, that allow us to have a simultaneously diagonalizable matrices, then, then it's fine. And that's actually the last question that we are going to comment now. OK, so just to conclude what I was saying, you have to write the scalar potential, find the physical scalars. And then so basically, you rotate what we have here. And I'll not bother with that, but I'll put in the, the, the solutions that we find in the web. OK, so now let's think about the, the point E here. Can you devise a symmetry to avoid these dangerous FCMC effects at three level? Um, OK, so and uh, I don't know. Uh, normally, I, I would ask you how to do that. But since we cannot interact, let me give you the answer. So. Uh, I'll see before you continue, a uh, more generic question. We are still keeping scalar that could disappear in the unitary gauge. Um, no, no, so here, I'm, I'm, I'm working in the unitary gauge. Um, yes, OK, OK. That, that's true. So that, that's what, what I was saying. So when you take this eta one, eta two fields, here you have to do a rotation with an angle beta to find the G zero and A zero, okay? And if you take ho one and ho two, you do a rotation with an angle alpha with the Higgs, the CP even Higgs. Well, let, let's assume that CP is conserved in the scalar potential. Here, you, you can show that this angle beta that you need to rotate is actually related to the ratio of the VEVs. 
and alpha actually comes from the scalar potential. So, yes, and then when you when you do that, you have the goldstone here that's eaten by the Z, and and and, and a, sim, a similar rotation is needed to find the, the goldstone for the charged um, Higgs uh, charged sector that gives the mass to the W. But as you see here, you have two independent parameters that would just um, change a bit the proportionality here. But uh, in general, it's still these matrices are not the same. They're not um, yeah, simultaneously diagonalizable, as I said. OK, but th thanks for the questions. It's an important point. Thanks to you. OK, so now how can we devise a symmetry to, to, to avoid this problem? Um, yeah, let me, okay, let's. So let me use this so I don't have to write it again. So how do we do it? There are many ways, but um, I think the simplest solution was proposed a long time ago and it's what called, it's called not natural flavor conservation. And the point here, and the problem is that you have two Higgs doublets that couple to each type of Fermi. And the idea is that we could propose a Z2 symmetry that let's say charges the two Higgs doublets and the different, let's say the, the singlet fermions. And imagine that uh, we give a different Z2 symmetry, Z2 charge for the two scalars. And then, uh, and then you can use this Z2 symmetry to forbid the couplings of, um, of one of the Higgs to each of the fermions, meaning that each type of fermion should couple to a single Higgs. So if I, if I do an assignment like this, oh, only phi one will couple to, to so that means that uh, all the, the matrix is two here, UDL will be zero, okay? But there are other choices, namely we could couple the Dow quarks to one of the doublets and the electron and the uptype to the other of the doublets. And there are actually four choices here that, that you can do. So let's say minus, 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 plus, plus, plus. So you could couple this way or you could couple in this way. And these are different types of two example models where you don't have this FCMC at three line. Okay. So this is one of the solutions, but there are others. And you could, for example, assume that the two u call matrices are, um, are proportional one to the other. So in this case, we couldn't have F, C, and Cs. OK. So if you have no questions, I propose that we move to the second exercise. That will be a bit shorter. No other questions, so please go on. And now it's about the CK matrix. So. As it, we just showed, but and you also saw in the lectures, the CKM matrix is unitary. It's what we call, I call V here. So we have all these relations. So when we multiply V dagger to V or V to V dagger, uh, we know that this should be delta IJ when it's sum over columns or rows of, of the CKM matrix here. And from each of these relations where you, you have a zero, you can define what we call an unitary triangle. And let's just take the example that. Um, year and eight discussed in the lectures. So if I take I to be one and J to be three, I can, I find this equation. So view D v, from, from this relation, view B plus VCD, VCB star, VTD, VTB star, this should be zero. And then you can just divide by one of them to, to find what I have here. Okay, so there are many equations uh, you could have taken. This is the one that's nice because this parameter, if you expand it in terms of the Kabebo angle, you see that's order one. This is order one. So if you try to make a, a triangle in the complex plane, this is the one that has all the sides of, of more or less the same size. And that's precisely how it is defined. So the, this is these are vectors in the complex plane. So what you can do is to, so the middle term here is just a vector that goes from zero to one. And then you can add the second one that you go somewhere in the complex plane. And then the third one that closes back to zero. And these are the famous alpha, beta, and gamma angles of the CKM matrix. 
okay? And the exercise is, first of all, to find what these angles are, then to show that they are indeed physical, meaning that uh, if you do a quark redefinition, they, they, uh, you, you, still, uh, you find something that's invariant uh, under these uh, transformations. And finally, we will compute the, compute the area of this triangle to show that it's proportional to this, to the Yarkso, Yarkso invariant that's related to CB violation this other model. And then the, there is a third, a fourth question here about how to determine the, the different um, moduli of CK matrix elements, but I'm going to skip this since we don't have much time. Okay, so here's just some trigonometry. So I, I did already, so I'm going to, to just show you the results. So first of all, let's um, try to find gamma. And that's very easy because we have this vector. So if you take minus, minus this vector, we have something that goes from zero here to this point. So gamma is nothing else than the argument of uh, this minus this complex quantity. Well, for beta, you can do something similar, but then you have to take pi minus beta here. And then this will be the argument of, of this vector. And then uh, here, what we do is that the uh, argument of, uh, of z equals minus argument of one over z, okay? And then um, when you do that, you can also take into account that uh, argument of uh, z1, z2, that's arg c1 plus z2. So that's what I use here in the second line to to simplify beta and to find the, the expression that I mentioned you before. And then it, it's simple to find alpha in terms of uh, gamma and beta that we know because alpha plus beta plus gamma is just pi. So you can just replace this equation and play a bit uh, with, the, with the relations to show that um, alpha is given by a, a relation that's written here. So I'll send you the solutions. You can try to do it by yourself later. So these are the formula for alpha, beta, and gamma. And now let's do the, the second exercise that's more interesting, which is to show that these are actually um, uh, phase, um, invariant under phase redefinition of the quark fields. So let me write what we have. Argument, VTD, VTB, VUD, VUB, star, beta, which is argument, minus VCD, VCB star, TD, and gamma, which is arc, minus VUD, QB star. Okay, so first of all, what are these phase redefinitions? And the point is, after we have done this rotation from flavor to mass basis, we find the CK matrix, but we are still free to do one kind of rotation which could be, for example, to take the top quark, both top right and top, top left, and redefine them in the same way with a phase here, okay? So if you do a phase redefinition like this, so all the other interactions of the standard model, they remain the same, except for the CKM matrix that we will be redefined by this, um, this phase that appears here. And you can do the same for each of the quarks. So you have a number of independent rotations that, that can be done. And uh, okay, so the, the parameterization of the CKM depends on the, the basis that you choose, but the unitary triangle does not depend on it. And that, that's the point of this exercise. So since we talk about, about the top quark, so let's show how this, why this alpha, beta, and gamma are independent of phase variable definitions. And the point is very simple. So when you look at the, the, the top, the, the terms with the top quark here, for example, you have VTD, V. So it, it always appears in this way, VTE, VTI, VTJ star. So when you do this rotation, you have EI pi times the same thing, VTI, VTJ, EI minus pi. So, so the two terms cancel out and that's why it's invariant. And the same is true for the up quarks, you see. So you have a VUD times, times ZUB star, and the same thing here for the charm and, and so on. Okay, so this is for the up quarks, up type quarks. 
Now, let's look at the down type. And now here, the point is different. Let's, let's look at the transformation of the B quarks. And if we look at these matrices, we have, for example, here, we have PTB divided by VUB star. So what happens is that uh, this angle cancels out between numerator and denominator. And um, the same is true for all the terms that depend on, on the downtime quarks. And this is the proof that it's um, reparameterization invariant. So that means that the, the three angles here, they are physical, and so are the sides of the entire triangle. So these are really observables that you can try to determine experimentally. OK, do you have questions? There are no questions. So if not, uh... The third point is just to determine the area of this triangle. So let me show you the results. So what we do? Yeah, here. So if you want to change, find the area is very simple. You have just to multiply the height of this triangle with its base, which is one, and divide by two. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And this side here is given by the the imaginary part of minus this vector that, that we mentioned before now. So, so the one that go from zero to this point. So the area is just one half, one imaginary part of this quantity. And now what you can do is to multiply inside of the imaginary part by VCD star VCB, VCD star VCB. And then you have the, the absolute value of this quantity that you can take out from the imaginary part. And you are left with this, with uh, the imaginary part of VUD, VUB star, VCD star times VCD. And this is uh, what we call the Yartso invariant. And if you replace the, the parameterization of a general unitary matrix, you see that this quantity is zero if, um, if CP. Um, is not violated. So this is really a measurement of, of how much CP is violated in the quark sector. That's given by the area of this triangle. Okay. And I'll not discuss the, the point D here, but um, um, I'll give you the solutions next week. Okay, so that's all we had to do concerning the CKM matrix. Now let's talk a bit about symmetries. Um, do you have any questions? I'm going too fast, and too slow. You can go on, obviously there are no questions regarding the, pre the previous uh, exercise. Okay, good. Okay, so now we talk a bit about symmetries and um, And the point uh, is that we have a few accidental symmetries in the standard model. So these are global symmetries that um, appear after um, I mean, you write out the, the standard model Lagrangian using the, the gauge symmetry. Yeah. So that's why we call them accidental. One of them is what we call the lepton number and the other one is the baryon number. And there are also accidental symmetries related to the conversion of lepton flavor which is forbidden in the standard model, there are no neutrino masses. Okay, and then here uh, we want to write the, the effective, the lowest order effective operators that can contribute to this kind of processes. So let me just remind you that, um, okay, so if you, if you believe that the standard model is not a theory of everything, and we have many reasons to believe that, you should, uh, Extend its Lagrangian to have, in addition to the to the renormalizable part here, a non-renormalizable part that has um, operators of this kind. So you have operators of dimension d, okay, d with d bigger than five. So they're non-renormalizable, and here you have an inf infinite series. And lambda is what we call the EFT cutoff, which is the, um, 
characterization of our ignorance in the sense that uh, these particles that should complete this standard model should appear above this cutoff. And this approach is, is very useful in flavor physics, especially because we have many scales. And uh, you can use it and as long as the energy of uh, the quantity, the observable you're looking at uh, is much smaller than this EFT cutoff. Oops, what happened? And that's, that's the case. Because uh, despite the fact that we have an infinite series of operators here, that they are always suppressed by powers of E over lambda when you compute a given observable. So, so, and this is a small number and you can always truncate this series so, so that you have a finite number of operators and effective coefficients that sit in front of them here, which parameterize this heavy new degrees of freedom that we do not know. And then the question is to find the lowest order operators that uh, break these accidental symmetries. And let's start with the lepton number. So I, I think I discussed this in the lecture. So let me just give you the answer and then we'll do the bottom number. There is only one operator. Um, so of dimension five in the standard model, this is what we call the Weinberg operator. And this is precisely one operator that breaks lepton number. And it looks a bit like this. So, so it's a dimension five, so we need two lepton fields and two Higgs doublets. And if you look for the combination that um, is invariant under the, the full standard model symmetry, SU3, that's not important here, but uh, SU2 left and U1 hypercharge, the operator that you can write down looks like this. C, so the conjugate Fermion field, we have the Higgs. Actually, you, you can have flavor indices for the lepton field, so IJ. Okay, so uh, I, I like to verify that this is indeed invariant under this local symmetry. Now, for, for the bio number violating operators, we need to go to higher dimensions. And it's only at dimension six that we can um, find some of these operators. So, since we're not, uh, you don't ask many questions, let me ask you a question. So I want to write an operator for dimension six um, that breaks pattern numbers. Um, so, so that will be an operator with, um, so how many quark fields should I have? At, the, the, the minimal number of quark fields that I should have in this operator. If I want to have something that's SU3 invariant, but that breaks a pattern number. So don't be shy, yeah? Yes. So how many quarks I need? Okay, someone is answering three. Three, okay, very good, yes. That's a good answer. Because of course, uh, or need more than one. If you have two, if you have QQ, that's not uh, invariant that SU3, and QQ bar would not uh, break, would not carry a, a bottom number charge. So you need at least QQQ. And, and, and here the point is that you need QQQ and then a lepton. And you can make this invariant under SU3 if you, you take the fully anti-symmetric combination of color. So if you take alpha, beta, gamma are color indices. So if you write something of this kind, this would be one of these viable operators. Okay. So, that, so alpha, beta, gamma are SU3 indices. We should also write indices for SU2, okay? Which I didn't do so far, but we, we'll do it together, indices. And well, and in principle, the, this, this fields, they also carry a flavor index that I'll, I'll denote with capital letters, flavor. Okay, so now, now how do we make this operator gauge invariant? Okay, so first, first of all, we should make it Lorentz invariant. So we, let, let's take, let's write one operator with the quark tablets. 
So if I want to make it Lorentz invariant, I have I should have q bar q. So here that's why I put this uh, complex conjugate, uh, the Fermi conjugate, and then I can couple the the q with the lepton doublet. Okay, again with this conjugation. As we said, it has to be fully anti-symmetric. Okay. Oh, it's just like SU2, for example, if, if you remember from quantum mechanics, uh, when you want to com combine two um, fundamental representations, uh, is the fully anti-symmetric com combination that is a, a scalar. And that's that's true when, when you have SUN and then SU3. So, so that's why we need the Levitivita symbol. So we need, we have Q1, Q alpha, Q beta, Q gamma. Okay, now how we have to, to, make, to make it invariant uh, under SU2. So this is an SU2 doublet, this is an SU2 doublet, and the only way to make it is to, so if you put the SU2 index here, I, J, K, L, they should also be anti-symmetric under this indices, K, L, okay? And, um, well, that, that's all actually. So this is the operator. In principle, we should also write the, the flavor indices, but I'll not do it so far. So for example, here, since it's fully anti-symmetric in color, can I have quark fields with the same flavor? It's a question for you. Could I have um, a flavor index that, uh, that's one, uh, one, one here? Someone says yes, someone else says no. Okay, so the, the good answer is no. Because since it's anti-symmetric in color, if you swap A and B here, then you get a minus sign when you change the Levitivita symbol. So if I had one, one, I would find that this operator would be equal to, to, to minus itself. So it would be zero. So you can you can put flavor indices here. And the, the only thing that you need is that the alpha A, B, and C are different, okay? because otherwise you have something that's zero. Okay. Now let's move on. There are, there are actually five operators that you can write down. So I'll not show one by one, but you, yeah, I haven't verified that the hypercharge indeed gives zero, but you can do that yourself. And so you just what is shown here. And then there are four other types of operators that are made of, uh, that also have the, the weak singlets. And uh, notice also that these operators, they violate B, they violate le left on number, but they, they conserve B minus L and that's a, an interesting feature. So bio number at lowest order in the standard model should conserve B minus L. Okay, now the, the point C here is about the, the, the proton decay B. Yeah, what, what is funny about these operators is that they can violate, uh, they can, make the, the proton unstable. So the proton is made of U, U, D, okay? So, and U, U, D, and you, you can show that, that uh, yes, well, the, the different types of operator, but let's say, yeah, uh, let's take one like this. From here, so if you have three quarks and one lepton, you, you could have something like this. D bar, D bar D is the pi zero. So you could have the proton decay to pi zero E minus. And that's of course something that's forbidden in the standard model. And there are searches for that. So that is a very useful limit on the physics. And uh, the, in this exercise, uh, we ask you to estimate what, what would be the rate for this proton decay. And say a uh, question. I see, yes, there's a question. Uh, before you said that the flavor indices should be different one from each other, but in this case, uh, the interaction is up, up, down. So yes. the question is uh, how is uh, possible? Yeah, so this is possible uh, because um, it, this, the flavor index cannot be the same if I have a, 
if I have three correct doublets, you see, but uh, I could take one operator like this. Uh, no, let me see. Yeah. One where, okay. So, so first of all, it's that's true in the flavor basis, but of course, uh, Q, it's V dagger U, V, okay. So, of course, if you can, so even if I have Q1, Q2, you can still have in the mass basis, um, up one and and up one because uh, you can have the CK matrix that plays a role there. Okay, but uh, th this is just one op operator that you can write down. So if you are not happy with that, you could also have the proton decaying this way, up, down. And now I think you should have the neutrino. So yes, this is fine. So you could have the proton decay. So let's take um, yes, exactly. So down, and now I have the proton that decays to pi zero. No, no, that's a problem here. It should be up, of course. Up, the proton decays to, to, to pi plus neutrino, and that's also possible. So it doesn't change the argument, but it's a good question. Thanks. Okay, okay so now, now we want to estimate this decay rate. And how do we do that? So first of all, it's a two-body decay, so we should have a factor of one over eight pi. Then um, from this operator, we know that it should be proportional to C lambda squared because it's dimension six is squared. And now the dimension of gamma is one. So, and the only mass scale that you have here is the proton mass. So from naive dimensional analysis, you know that you have, you should have a, the proton mass to the 50 power here. So let's say that a natural value for this coupling would be one. It is of course an assumption, but uh, let's make it. And now we can use the limit that is given here by the experiment Super Camille Kanda that uh, looked for the proton decay. And th that might sound weird, but they can do that because they have so many protons in these huge tanks of water that they are able to set a, a lower limit on the proton lifetime in this specific channel. So from this, I, I let you do the exercise. And so we, basically we, we have just that uh, this quantity should be bigger than one over tau of the proton that's given by the experiment. And if you take C to be one, what is very funny is that you find lambda to be bigger than 10 to the 16 GV, yeah. And so that's why it's um, this type of search of new physics is so impressive. You can really probe very, very high energy scales. And actually, if you do a proper calculation, you find something that's very similar to what we found here with this very um, sketchy derivation. OK, and then we don't have time. And so I leave you as a homework to do the point D here, not C. <laughs> We're talking about uh, these operators that they should also carry flavor indices. And here we make an assumption that, um, that are, we want just the operators that are invariant under the global symmetry of flavor that we have in the standard model gauge sector. So that means uh, unitary rotations of, of each of these um, types of fermions. And the question is, what is the lowest dimension of operator that can actually be made consistent with this requirement? So I, I leave you that as an exercise. And let me just anticipate that uh, the answer will be much larger than, than six. Okay, now, last point. We have only five minutes and we have really, um, uh, uh, we have time constraints, so we, we, we cannot, we cannot, um, so we have to finish in five minutes. And uh, so I won't have much time to discuss this last exercise. And I forgot to copy the solutions here. And for some reason, I'm not able to find them. Yeah, but the, the, this last question is about uh, this, uh, all the experimental results that have been observed at um, LHCB in measurements of um, this universality ratios. So basically, we're looking at transition, which is BS mu mu divided by BS EE. And here, when you look at the exclusive decay that depends on this transition and you make this ratio, you expect this to be one with a very good uh, precision. 
because the mu and the electron mass are negligible, and this is the only source of difference between yeah, the, the, the different lepton flavors. And what, what is very odd is that experimentally they found 0.85. And if that's true, and if it's confirmed in the future, that would mean that we're, we're seeing new physics in our energy observable, which is, would be, of course, um, would have a huge implications for particle physics. And here in the problem, we give you what is the effective operator that you need in order to explain these deviations. Basically, you, we assume that a new physics is entering the, the decays with muons. So we have an operator which is SB mu mu. Here is just a normalization to match uh, and then what happens in the standard model. This is a loop process, and, okay? And basically you need this effective coefficient here, delta CL, delta CL, okay? Which has to be of order 0.4 with a minus sign if you want to explain the deviations. And then the exercise is to first, to show which are the operators that are invalid under the full standard model symmetry that can give rise to these interactions. And remember from the lectures, there are many EFTs that you can write down. It depends on, always on the scale that you pick. So the, the one that's written here is invariant only under SU3 color and in one electromagnetism, because this is the symmetry that we have at the, the beam quark scale where we're doing this measurement. But of course, uh, we have we have expectations that new physics is probably heavy, so that appears well above the electric symmetry. So, and if the electric symmetry is still there, the operators that you have to write they they, they should fulfill this this condition here, well, just like the ones we did for for the for the proton decay. So the building blocks are not um, the different quark and lepton fields, but uh, the the doublets and singlets. Okay where the quark doublet here has the CKM. And then the question is to show which are the operators that can induce these effects. We don't have much time. Let me just give the answer. There are actually two operators that you can write down. So one of them is just uh, you replace uh, the, yeah, so notice that we have a P left and P left projector here. So this is what we, is hinted uh, experimentally. So if you want to complete this with quark doublet, one option is very easy. Is just to replace uh, these quark fields by the quark doublets and the leptons by the, the lepton doublet. And then, of course, if you expand this operator, you have a DD mu mu, okay, with different flavor indices, but you could also have interactions um, with the neutrinos here. So that you have many more interactions and correlations that arise from this, uh, from, from the fact that you have now the SU2 invariant operators. This is one option. And the other operator is it's it's similar. The only difference is that you have an SU2 triplet here. So tau i are the poly matrices. And I leave you as an exercise to show that this is also invariant under SU2. Okay. And then what happens is that um, these operators, they can induce BS mu mu, but they have other phenomena like BS to neutrino, neutrino that's coming from here. And for this operator, you can even have a charge it interaction. So the same operator could contribute to B to C, mu neutrino, if, if you take the same uh, indices or tau neutrino if you allow to have um, different flavor indices. And the last part of the exercise is to estimate. So from the fact that we in the low energy Hamiltonian, we see a coefficient of order 0.4, what is the maximum scale of new physics that could give rise to these effects? And to do that, you just have to match uh, so this Lagrange that we had before with the one that is C1 over lambda square with this operator, where C1 here would be proportional to, to the new physics coupling squared divided by the scale lambda. And if you do that and you can check the solutions, what we find is that uh, by taking these numbers, if you put the couplings to be one here in the numerator, the mass of this particle can be as large as 12 TV. And if you take it to be square root of four pi, which is um, a good limit for a perturbative theory, actually this is 30 TV. So you see, it's quite high. And it's an example of how flavor physics can probe energy scales that go well beyond the ones that we normally can reach with colliders.
the energy of central mass of LHC is 13 GeV. Okay, so so that's all. Um, so it's 11. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, you, you can go to the CMS. That is Actually, I have to say that if you have any question, please write directly to Olsi because uh, they asked me to be really on time for the visit. So thanks a lot, Olsi. It was very, very clear. And thanks for the, the explanations. Uh, remember to everybody that uh, here goes the link. Uh, I just put it in the, in the chat for the visit that is starting now. And please use the question and answer uh, chat in order to make uh, iterative a little bit the visit. So you can make the questions, not wait for the, for the end, but you can make the questions during the visit. Okay, so thanks a lot again, Orsi, and see you everybody on Monday. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, thank you.